Well, Richard and his twin brother, Richard, did a great job of announcing K-Group. Um, the fact that we're doing a kind of a reboot, we do regroup always in August before groups start, but here in the middle of the year, sometimes we don't give a clean, easy passage for people to jump into K-Groups, and so that's what this is about. This is giving you an opportunity, if you're not connected, to meet our leaders. We'll give you a list. There's a couple of leaders that aren't here today. But uh, we would be more than happy to share with you when those groups meet, give you a little paper that tells you when the groups are, because we want everybody to be part of a K-group. And most of our K-groups, uh, well, actually about half and half, half meet on Wednesday, half meet on Sunday. And so there's a lot of different times, and so you can jump right in and visit a few if you're not part of a K-group. But we hope you will be part of one of those. And also, a uh, great group for Intro to Grace last week. If you missed Intro to Grace, uh, go ahead and come to the membership class today at 3.30 and then we can make up that uh, Intro to Grace with you if you'd like. And so I hope you'll be part of that if you started Intro last week. I hope you'll join us back again today at 3.30 for the first of two membership classes. So we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And so let's read this together, and then we'll look at it. Paul writes, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that just continues just to uh, just meet our soul where it's at, God. If we're thirsty, if we're full, no matter where we're at today, God, your word speaks truth to us, God, and help us to remember today while we're here, what our purpose in life is. And God, I pray you'll use your word in a powerful way just to move us and shape us to be more and more like Jesus. God, I pray for those right now who uh, feel despair. They feel a lot of anxiety. They feel a lot of stress in their lives right now for various reasons. God, I pray that today will be particularly meaningful to them to put in perspective the work that you're allowing to be done in their life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So some of you who may be older, I won't define what that is, um, you may not know the term social media influencer. That may not be something that is real common uh, expression for you, but social media influencer is somebody who's built up a large audience, and they have a lot of influence over their audience, uh, and they build up their audience by branding or by product use or by they travel a lot, and so they have a lot of uh, people who follow them on social media, and they use their influence, they lose their audience to promote various things, and usually make money, they have money connected to it. So these are social media influencers. And this is crazy, but I was reading that 27% of Gen Z, and if you're Gen Z, that means you're born between 96 and 2010, they see this as their desired future. This is what they want to do with their life. They want to be an influencer. And so what this has done, kind of like I talked about a few weeks ago, like the selfie kind of thing, you know, this has created a generation, or in fact, encouraged a generation, maybe a better way of saying it, to be on social media, often always crying, look at me, look at what I'm doing, check my life out, love me, support me, those type of things. So it's breeding this sort of need for attraction and influence. And, and so you have 27% of Gen Zers who are drawn to this kind of thing. And sadly, many of these people will do anything. I mean, they'll do literally anything almost in order to gain followers, increase their following, get more attention, and ultimately, you know, gain more revenue. And so while social media, we see, is pushing this desire for fame, the desire for fame and recognition and notoriety isn't anything new. It's not an invention of social media. In fact, if you go back to the Greeks, the Greeks believe that your status would carry on through eternity. In fact, if you had a statue that was built in your honor or an epic poem written about you or a street named after you, then you would just live on. Your life was extraordinary. And so they even had the word for this was about glory and fame, kleos, which was 
this notoriety, this bigger than life glory that existed, and they wanted to and desired that. So it's not something new that you have social media, and so you're promoting yourself. We've always, as human beings, always desired some recognition, some attention, and those type of things. And so it's easy to disconnect and say, well, I'm not even on social media. Like, I don't even have a, an Instagram account. I don't even know about all that junk. I'm not, I'm not into that. Well, I want you to think about your life for a second before we jump into these verses, because I want you to connect where you find your need for recognition, and I would say even glory in the flesh. Maybe it's just a constant need for affirmation. If you're not getting the affirmation you need, then you're just depressed. Love of status. You like to walk in somewhere and be noticed, or you like to drive a certain brand of car or wear certain things in order to be noticed. A lot of people, you know, Christians find themselves humble bragging, right? Saying things, you know, that, are, that appear humble, but to get recognition. And then spiritual bragging. Sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, having a two-hour devotion uh, with the Lord today on Instagram, right? I mean, you're, you're promoting your life and yourself and your spirituality, and you're using that for attention. Uh, some of us spend money that we don't have on things to impress other people. We, we care about impressing, and so no matter what, we're going to spend in order to be noticed. How about other people who live vicariously through your children, right? Your glory days are past, but hey, your kid, you can live through them, right? I've been there, done that. And, and so we can do that as well. Obsessed with winning. You're just prideful, and you, losing is not part of the equation, right? You're not going to lose gracefully because all you want to do is win. Another way that we can make it about our fame and our glory is just a refusal to apologize. You get in a spite with your spouse, you're not going to say you're sorry. You're not going to admit weakness. That's a way. Here's another one. Measuring your success by what you see and feel in the moment, right? What, feels, what does it feel like? And you feel good based upon that. And so you're motivated or unmotivated by praise or the lack of praise around you. And so we all have these areas where we seek our glory, where we seek our fame, for each one of us, it may be a little bit differently, different, but nevertheless, we can be fixated on our own glory and our own fame without ever posting anything on social media. Well, in our text today, Paul gives us a completely different way of living life, something that is so counterintuitive to the natural flesh, to the way that we want to draw attention to us. And Paul started this off last week by talking about how dependent he was upon God's mercy, that God's mercy, what Jesus did for him undeservingly, that's what drove him. And Paul has spoken about how he rejects position and power and prestige as a means to be influential in God's kingdom. Rather, Paul knows that in order to advance God's kingdom, Jesus has to be the main thing. It has to be pointing to Jesus. And even though Paul was an impressive guy on some level, education-wise, at one point, he did have status. He knows that it's not about him. It's about Jesus. And that's exactly how he starts this off by saying, and we have this treasure in jars of clay. We have this treasure in these jars of clay. What treasure is Paul talking about here? He's talking at great lengths about the new covenant ministry that he's been given by Jesus. On the road to Damascus, Jesus gave him the task, the ministry, to evangelize the Gentile world, to spread the gospel around the world. And that's not something just unique to Paul. We've all been giving that, given that mission to spread the gospel in our sphere of influence. But Paul was especially given this new covenant gift where he was showing the, the Jewish people, the Judaizers, that it's not about, even though the law was glorious in its moment, but God was doing a new thing. And we talked a lot about this over the last few weeks. God's doing a new thing through the new covenant. No more need to go and sacrifice in the temple. No more need to go to a priest and offer up on your behalf some sacrifice. Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice for sins. No more need for the old covenant sacrificial system. And so the strict obedience to the Mosaic law and doing these things because the wages of sin is death, that the law required no longer necessary. Jesus is now the ultimate once for all sacrifice for sin. So that's the context for what Paul says, I have this treasure in jars of clay. But also in the immediate context, 
we're starting here in verse 7, but if you'll go back one verse, the verse we ended out on last week, this will give you the immediate context. And look, here's, here's a phrase that Howard Hendricks said at Dallas Seminary. It stuck with me. He said, context is king, right? Context is king. That means that you look at the context for what a scripture is given at that moment. Don't just pull it out and just run with it on whatever you think it says. Look around the verses in the chapter to know what's being said here. And so verse 6 really helps us understand verse 7. For God, let's read it. It'll be on the screen. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. And now he says, and we have this treasure in jars of clay. So he's speaking about God's light shining through our hearts out to the unbelieving world and those around us. So the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, that's the treasure that's hidden in these jars of clay. All right, so they're hidden in just a simple, common, everyday thing like a, a jar of clay that would have been so common in every household during Paul's time. During Paul's time, every household would store things in jars made of clay. And these are just everyday, ordinary, pedestrian things. Inexpensive, they were broken, then you just threw them out. They were cheap and had no intrinsic value. And so common, fragile things made by hand during that time is a good picture I think Paul has given us as well. And so it seems counterintuitive for God to place his greatest treasure into the most fragile thing of all, does it not? All right, if we have something valuable, we put it in something where it can be protected or glorified, right? We don't want to put something that has of great value in something so common. We want to show it off. We want people to see it. We want to display it. But God purposely permits these frail jars to be battered and bro broken for a reason. Why? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us, verse 7. So he puts his light into this broken, battered, fragile clay jar in order for that light to shine out through the cracks, through the damage, through the, just the weakness of this vessel. Out th through that comes the light shining. And so God is using us in our weakness to shine forth his light. I love how the message paraphrase says this. He says, if you look only at us, you might well miss the brightness. I like how they pull together verses 6 and 7 in there. If you just look at us in, in ourselves, you're going to miss the, the brightness. But it's Christ shining through us is the point that Paul is getting at. And so Paul wants us to see that we can't lean on our own understanding, as Proverbs says. We can't trust our own wisdom. We can't think in a fleshly, earthly mindset. We must see that God is working through us for his glory, not for our glory. So how does this play out like on street level in your life, okay? How does it play out? Let's say you've been living the Christian life at work, and a coworker comes to you and says, hey, you know, tell me about the Bible. I have, I have a few questions for you. And your first reaction is to look at the vessel and say, whoa, I don't really know. I'm not a Bible scholar. I haven't had formal education. I don't want to mess this guy up. And so we look at the vessel and we begin to worry about what we might do instead of realizing that what matters is what God has put within us, his light, his truth. He's brought us into his family. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus. And this is an amazing opportunity that you've been given to shine his light out of your light, out of your life. But instead, you panic, you focus on self, and you begin to worry about what you might do rather than what God wants to do through you. And so we have to learn not to focus on the jar, but to focus on the treasure that's held within the jar. And so we should never complain about our limitations or our weaknesses. Because God did that specifically for reasons that he only knows sometimes in order to allow us to fulfill his will while on this earth. I think like the, the most obvious illustration in Scripture that I love to go to is Moses. Because when God came to Moses in the burning bush and he said, Moses, I'm going to lead my people out of Israel. God said what he was going to do, right? And what did Moses say? He's like, whoa, I'm pretty weak. Like, I, I can't speak. I'm not a great speaker. Let's recruit my brother Aaron. He's the guy who can speak well. I'm not the guy, God. You got the wrong dude, all right? 
he focused on himself rather than focusing on what God was going to do and use him in that process. And so God has incredible things that he wants to do through us. And while that some may look like Billy Graham for some people, for other people it's just a very simple, most of his ordinary, common life, just like these jars of clay that existed during Paul's time that were just common, everyday, everyday, ordinary things that oftentimes people just threw trash in. They were used for various household things. But these were where the treasure was hidden. And Paul says, that's who you are. You're ordinary. I'm ordinary. And Paul wants to make the point. The bigger context here, remember, is Paul is making the point. The Corinthians, who were they in love with? They were in love with the super apostles. They were in love with the big personalities, the big men who rolled into town with these great speaking skills and could command the crowd and could say, look at us, look at how smart we are, look how much wisdom we have. And the Greeks just valued this thing. And Paul says, look, it's not about you. It's not about, it's not about how great you are. You're looking at it wrong. In God's kingdom, it's not about how impressive the minister is. It's about the message. It's not Im- how important the, the messenger is. The message is what matters. And how do we get that screwed up? So much. we got to be super careful on this because I don't care what denomination you grew up in, no matter like where like your background in church history, all of us have a tendency to want to lift up and idolize people rather than to keep our eyes upon Jesus. And sometimes you have people who are in ministry who just are, incur- I mean, they're fleshly just like I am. And we all like our attention in a certain way, right? We all like to be affirmed and validated. And so you can take your eyes off Jesus and slightly put those over onto yourself, and all of a sudden, you make it about you. I, there, I came across, to me, this is just hysterical, but uh, I came across this church who gives out their coloring books to their kids, like we do the coloring sheets, and it has the picture of their pastor on there where you color, and it says on the sheet, this is actual, show the sheet, this is actual sheet, some kid colored on it, and the lady posted online. It says, we are united under the visionary. Blank church is built on the vision that God gave Pastor Blank. We will protect our unity in supporting his vision. All right, anybody find that kind of crazy, that fact that kids are coloring their pastor rather than Jesus, right? Like, it's crazy that sometimes we can take it and make it about ourselves. We're the brand. We're the one that you should look at. And our world is full of this. And I'm not saying this church and this guy is a bad guy. I don't know him personally. All I'm just saying is it all it takes is a one or two degree shift, and all of a sudden you're off of Jesus and you're on yourself. And we're, not, we're all guilty of this. We all are guilty about self-promotion. But we need to remember that God has created us to be ordinary influencers. Ordinary influencers. And you know what God cares most about when it comes to ordinary influencers? He cares most about our holiness, what we're exemplifying and what we're showing in our lives. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.21, Paul says this to Timothy, his son in the faith. He says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So you want to be useful to the master of the house? He says, Cleanse yourself from what's dishonorable and be a vessel for honorable use. How? By being holy in your life. By being holy, pursuing holiness. And so if you're in leadership, and today we're going to do ordination for deacons at the end of the message. If you're in leadership in this church, remember that the best thing that you can do is to pursue Jesus and be holy as God is holy. Yes, it's important to hone your leadership skills, to be available and to be uh, on spot and serving and be teaching. But the most important thing that we can do as leaders is to live a life of authenticity where we're meeting with Jesus, we're spending time with him, and we're reflecting and shining that light out of this broken, damaged, fragile vessel that he has put, given us to be ourselves. And so he has a way of training us to rely upon his strength and not on our own. And you want to hear how he does this? You want to hear how God does this in our life when we need to be brought down a notch or two? Verse 8, we don't like this process of of getting damage of cracks. Look what he says. He says, Paul says, we are afflicted, afflicted in every way but not crushed. We're perplexed but not driven to despair. We're persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, 
always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus can be manifested from our bodies. And so this process of God working in us and creating in us um, what he wants in order to display his glory, not our own, is not always fun process. In fact, I like if you follow uh, Paul Tripp on New Morning Mercies, if you read that, I know many of you do. He wrote this on February 1st just a few days ago. He says, none of us wakes up in the morning and prays, God, if you love me, will you send more suffering my way today? But in grace, he leads you to where you don't plan to go in order to produce in you what you couldn't achieve on your own. Wow, that's a, and a powerful statement. So God purposely puts us, like Paul says, we're afflicted. So the, the word is hard-pressed. God says, I'm going to put you in hard-pressed situations where you're going to be, feel like you're being crushed at times. But he says, I'm not going to allow you to be crushed. My children, I'm not going to allow that to, be happen, to happen to you. So maybe some of you feel that way right now. You feel like you're hard-pressed. And so the, the deal is we turn our eyes to Christ, and we see Christ, and we say, I know that I can trust you, that you won't crush me in this moment, that you're not going to crush me, that you're using this to make me fulfill my purpose, which is not to display me because I'm nothing to be looked at, but to display the glory and the light of Christ within us. He says, perplexed, but not in despair. He's perplexed. He's just bewildered. Paul has encountered situations where he just didn't know what was going on, what God was doing. And in fact, I wonder in this illustration of perplexed and not in despair, that Paul learned not to despair through personal experience himself. What am I talking about? Go back to chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Look what Paul writes. He says, For we do not, not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were utterly burdened beyond our own strength that we despaired of life itself. Get that? What Paul just said, he said, we're perplexed, but we're not in despair. But he said in verse 8 that he was despairing for life itself. What's up? Is that a contradiction? What was Paul talking about? Sometimes when we read about the apostles and these people in Scripture, we think they're just superhuman. We think that they never failed. They never went through times that they couldn't just, you know, muscle up and keep their eyes on Jesus. There were times where God had to teach them lessons just like he teaches us lessons. And there's times when we take our eyes off Jesus, and there were times when Paul took his eyes off Jesus. Look at verse 9. Finish the thought. Look at the screen or on your, in your Bibles. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So he says, this situation where we were in despair, God taught us, through that, not to rely upon ourselves, but to rely upon Jesus, who raises the dead. So Paul, I believe, learned through personal experience what it means here to, to trust in Jesus and to be perplexed, but not in despair. He learned from personal experience. How about you? Are you learning? Are you learning in these situations that have happened to you that have led you to despair, that God's trying to teach you something there? That God's trying to teach you to rely upon him. Paul goes on. He says, persecuted, and we know Paul was persecuted, but he wasn't forsaken. The idea was, God didn't abandon me. Sometimes we just question, why is God doing this to me? Where is God in all this? I was over here in a conversation yesterday of some people who were talking, and they're like, some people just really struggle with believing in God because their life has been so terrible and so awful, and bad things have happened. God is using those very things that are so difficult and, and tough to bring you to Jesus or point you to Jesus if you're his child. God is using those difficulties, that persecution, that perplexity, all those things that God has afflicted with us, he's using those to get our attention because chances are, God's not going to get our attention if we're laying on the beach with an umbrella and we're sipping on a cold drink, right? God doesn't get your attention in those moments. God gets your attention when you're persecuted and afflicted, perplexed. You don't know what you're going to do, where you're going to turn. You don't have answers to the situation. And then the final one, he says, Paul says, you're struck down. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Paul's building his resume. He's saying, look, our lives, here's, what, here's where our lives have been. Here's what our lives have been about. We've been struck down the, the the word here is 
one of a soldier being struck down by an opponent, but he's not killed. He's not killed by the opponent. Paul says, I've been struck down, but I'm not killed. I'm not destroyed. Always, verse 10, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be made manifest in our bodies. So he's saying Christians do not succumb to the problems and difficulties, but that's evidence that the life of Jesus is being revealed through us, through the power of God. That those situations where it could break us, it could destroy us, it could just destroy our faith, Paul says those very moments are the moments where God is revealing through the death of Jesus, through my identifying with his death, that he's being manifested in my body. He's being shown more and more. And look, you're here today, duh, right, obviously. But you know what? There's people here today who, who used to be here, and they didn't just go to another church. They have just drifted away from the faith completely. Why? Because hardship knocked at their door at some point, and they questioned God, and they questioned his goodness. They questioned whether he was really there. They questioned why this was happening to them, and they just abandoned their faith completely. They just walked away because they did not have faith that God was doing something good in their life, even through the pain. And so God allows us to experience problems to, so that life of Jesus shines even brighter through our lives. That's what he says in verse 11. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And so he says, what they did to Jesus, the death to Jesus, that's what they're trying to do to us as well. We're given over to death for Jesus' sake. But look what God's doing through all this. And Paul's ability to endure all this adversity that he faced was exactly because he understood this principle. He's writing about it, that it's not about the jar. It's about the light that's in the jar. It's about the truth that exists in your life. And so struggles and hardship, they're going to crack. They are going to crack you. They're going to damage you. They're going to make you feel terrible. They're going to make you feel like in the dead of night, like you're alone, like you're abandoned. But don't lose faith. Jesus is using these. And Paul says, I was to the breaking point of life itself. But God sustained him. And so we go undergo attacks. We undergo pressures. We undergo anxiety. We undergo death. We undergo all kinds of adversity. But Paul says, so death, verse 12, so death is at work in us, but life in you. Did you get that? Death is at work in us, but he's saying, but you Corinthians, life is at work in you. So through our death, through us going through all these things, so Christ can shine brighter, life is springing up in the Corinthian church. Life is coming about. And so Paul didn't quit because he remembered the life-giving treasure with which he was entrusted. Do you remember that when you're in the midst of hardship and pain? Do you think about that, that you have this life-giving gift, your salvation, Christ in you, the hope of glory? And so when bad things happen to you, God is making your light, the opportunity for your light to shine brighter through those cracks. So people can look at you and see the glory of God, that you're not that impressive, but God is impressive who lives in you. So don't quit when things are hard. See it as a privilege to shine your light and share the treasure that you have, which is the gospel. So the Corinthians, they had it all wrong, didn't they? We have it all wrong. We idolize people. We idolize preachers. We follow that guy on social media, and we look up to him because he's, you know, some has a a large church or a big crowd that follows him. That's okay if he's speaking into your life, but please don't put him on a pedestal. Please don't think that, you know, they're a perfect person and they're going to have it all together all the time. They struggle. They're a jar of clay, just like you're a jar of clay. I'm a jar of clay. But through the cracks and through the pressures, God reveals himself. God uses broken and humble people. Why? Because we don't get the glory. God gets the glory. And for those people who are truly his, God is using these situations to humble them so that God's seen, not them. God's in view, not them. So here's your application. Here's our application today. You are an ordinary influencer. You're ordinary. Plain and simple. You're ordinary, but 
because Christ is in you, you are an influencer. This is not about being, you know, anonymity, not, you know, not being you, right? This is God using you for his glory. So you have influence over other people. How are you utilizing that influence? And it, it, you may not be aware of it. Some of you, you know, you're, you're so down on your own spiritual life and yourself that sometimes you forget that people are watching. Before I ever got into ministry, when I was in my early 20s, and I felt like I wasn't even doing a really good job in this job of, of portraying Christ and, and pointing people to Christ. But anytime we'd have a, this was in the 90s, so, you know, people prayed back in those days, even if they weren't Christians. But we would have meals for work, and they would say, hey, John, will you pray? Because we know you're a Christian, right? And so people know. People know at your work, they know that you name the name of Christ. They know where you go on Sunday morning. They know what you do of your time. They know you're involved in a K group. They're looking at your life. But that doesn't mean you have to say, oh, I better keep it together, because if I don't keep it together, like, oh, I'm going to really blow it. That's self-focus. Focus your life upon Jesus, the treasure that's in you, that Christ has given to you. And so that's the heart application today. The hard application is when going through difficult times, trust there's more to the situation than meets the eye, that God is doing something in your life. He's using you. He's allowing these things to happen so you have a greater influence, a greater platform for him. As I mentioned, we're going to do deacon ordination in a minute. And deacons are called by God to minister to the needs of our congregation particularly the physical needs is why they were called uh, in the early church to care for the widows and the orphans and the, those who had needs during that time. But I think one thing we need to really remember, and this is important for all of us deacons, but every one of us, we need to remember that we can fix somebody's personal problems, their practical problems, their health needs. We can fix all those things, but if we don't speak to the spiritual need, have we really helped them that much? And even in our prayers, like, we're, we're guilty. All of us in our groups, we're guilty of this, at a, a prayer request, and we're mentioning this person's health, this person, you know, this situation, that situation. But sometimes we fail to pray for the need that really truly matters, which is the spiritual need. You see, because the longer you live on this earth, the more cracked and fragile this thing is going to become, right? Amen for anybody that's, like, over 50, right? Like, you get it, right? Like, like it's not going to be durable forever. Physical needs are going to happen. You can be healed from your current situation, but trust me, it's coming later on down the road. But what matters is the treasure that God's placed within each of us. And I mentioned that last week, that God wants to work on that interior, that that, that new life that he continues just to give us more and more light to shine for those around us. So don't be discouraged if you're here today and you're just like, I'm just physically, I'm falling apart. Right? Like Roy, he's probably watching, right? Right, Roy? Um, you know, you, things happen. You break bones. Things take place in our life that we don't like. But God is using these things to give greater influence for his kingdom. And so understand there's more to meet than meets the eye. And let's be a church that prays real prayers for spiritual needs. But in K-groups, let's make sure that we're praying, yes, God, we, we pray for healing for John, but we also, more importantly, we pray that this situation will, will spiritually encourage him, will help him to draw closer to you and to be more aware of your presence in his life. Those are the type of prayers that God wants us to pray, that are focused on what really matters, not just on what's in front of us, the material, the, the, the cracked jar that's laying there, right? And then finally, speaking of prayer, I really want to do something. I mentioned this to a staff a few weeks ago that this year I wanted to really have a group of people who really are truly fasting and praying for this church. And I want to call this the Fasting 15. And if, if we have 25 show up, we'll call it the Fasting 25. But I want at least 15 people to sign up to be on a rotation that is diligent in fasting and praying once a month on a rotation, maybe from Saturday night, from sunset to Sunday um, till after church at lunch. You know, we're talking about not eating for, what, 18 hours or something like that? And so if we had, if I'm preaching up here and I look out and I know that, you know, Michelle, this is her week, and, and I'm looking at her and I know she's praying and fasting for God to do great things in this, in this church and through this community, through our church. 
And over here, we got somebody else who's doing that as well. And I know I got two this Sunday and two next Sunday. And we're, we're really, truly, honestly seeking God. Because the truth is, we can do impressive things on our own, but at the end of the day, I mean, it doesn't matter. It just, it just, it's going to break. It's going to be fragile. But God shines his light through us, through his glory being revealed, through dependence upon him and allowing that treasure to shine. And so I, the hands application, I hope that 15 people, I can count on you to email me. It's in the app. You can, my email address, you can probably find it easy or see me afterwards. If you don't want to do all email, just say, hey, I want to be part of your fasting 15. I hope that 15 people will step up on rotation. doesn't mean you have to fast four times a month, just once a month I'm talking about to be part of this group, to just really pray and earnestly seek God to do something incredible through our church. Let's don't be playing church. Let's don't be playing just doing the religious stuff. Let's truly be seeking God and his glory and allowing his glory to shine through us every place we go, no matter where we're at. Be the church. Be the church. Let's pray. I'd like to ask our five guys and their spouses to come up here that we have, we're doing the ordination with today. And just, if you'll guys would just come to the front, Drew, Mac, Max, Scott. Got one more. Yeah, Kyle. And your, and your spouse, if you're with, if they're with us today. And then I ask you guys just to stand here and then we ask our elders to come up and join us and just to lay hands on these guys. And we're going to pray over these guys in closing asking God to really make these guys servants for you. Serving this church, serving Jesus Christ. And I appreciate their willingness uh, to serve and to care for this body in very practical ways. And if you guys could just spread out and just lay your hand on a shoulder. Please be praying with me as I pray. Father God, I thank you for each one of these men. I thank you for Kyle. I thank you for Drew, for Mac, for Max, for Scott. I thank you for the way that the church has identified you working in their life, that the, the treasure that's, that's hid in this jar and clay is, is shining. It's coming out through their lives. And I thank you for the way that you've worked and the way you've moved in their families, the way they're leading their family, the way they're taking um, just leadership with their children. God, really, truly making an impact for you in their home. And God, I thank you for the desire to serve this church body in very tangible, practical ways. But God, even in the tangible and practical, help them to remember what I said this morning, that it's, it's what really matters is the spiritual need. And you've called them and you've given them the character and you're working in them so they can not only speak to the physical need, but more importantly, to the spiritual need of this congregation. And God, I thank you for what you're doing in their lives. And God, I pray that we'll be an encouragement to them. Help us to spur them on when they feel battered and beat down and they feel like that you're not there with them. God, help us through just being the hands and feet for you, God, to love on them and to encourage them and thank them for the work that they're doing. And God, I pray you'll just move us all to be more passionate about your name and your glory, and less about our own name and our own glory. Help us to remember this week that we're truly ordinary influencers for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, guys.